Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I wanted to begin today uh, with a question. Um, and that question is, what does the face of disease look like in Sub-Saharan Africa? Now, of course, uh, especially with the emergence of diseases like Ebola uh, and the accompanying media coverage that we've all uh, been in exposed to, um, it is quite clear that we all have different images of disease and what it looks like in Africa. Um, here I show uh, a very tame uh, uh, picture, in my opinion, of what the face of disease might look like in Africa. This is a picture of a young boy uh, who lives in Accra, on the outskirts uh, of Accra in Ghana, West Africa, going about his daily chores uh, where he is uh, cleaning uh, a fishnet. But this fishnet he's cleaning, uh, he's cleaning dirty water that's festering with uh, disease um, and, and obviously this is a concern. Um, but in fact, you know, that's not the story I want to tell you today. Uh, what I'd like to share with you is a different story, uh, a different face of disease in Africa, and that is my story, um, because I believe, like many others that have a story, uh, a similar story to tell, I represent the face of disease in Africa. You see, I was born in Ghana in West Africa, um, and I was born to a mother uh, who's a teacher and instilled in, in me uh, a love for education and an appreciation for education and to really strive for excellence. And to a father who's a medical doctor. Now my father's story I think is a very interesting one in my opinion. Uh, he completed his primary and secondary school education in, in Ghana and ultimately won a government scholarship uh, to study medicine um, in what was then Russia at Laval University in, in the early 60s during the Cold War era. Uh, what is ultimately now Ukraine, and he lived there for seven years. Um, and following that time, he then went to Australia, uh, where he uh, uh, carried out postdoctoral studies and uh, and earned um, <clears throat> a master's in public health. And he augmented this training at uh, in Nigeria and also in Senegal and Kenya uh, to further expand his uh, public health education and, and studies. And so, as you can very well imagine, uh, he definitely brings a global perspective, and by all measures, our family lived a fairly privileged life in Ghana. Uh, some of my earliest uh, childhood memories come from the town of Balgatanga, which is in the northeast corner of Ghana. This is a dusty town, and I remember distinctly as a child uh, what is called the Hamatan season, where a cold, dry wind will blow down from the, the Sahara Desert, uh, leaving in its wake chapped lips and chapped feet on all the children. Uh, Balga, in our time there, um, this town was called Balga, uh, affectionately, uh, we learned how to ride cows and donkeys with the local tribe's kids. Uh, these were the Fra Fra kids. And uh, these boys also taught me how to wrestle. And so, you know, you don't want to mess with me on the street, okay? Um, <laughs> and they would wrestle while the cows were at pasture because these boys were shepherds. Um, and so those were, those were really wonderful times and, and times when I really formed a lot of memories. Uh, but Balga was also a place where I became familiar with disease. Um, and I distinctly remember uh, my first instance of this. So most children in, in, in America and elsewhere uh, might have heard of iodine being an important nutrient, perhaps from looking at a can and the labeling on a can of sea salt. We all know how we love sea salt these days. Um, and clearly iodine is important. Um, but I first learned about this um, in Ghana, in Balgatanga, at a local flour mill, uh, where I incessantly asked an aunt of mine why a woman that was at this millet mill had such an impossibly swollen neck. Uh, you see, this woman had goiter, uh, which is a, an affliction that arises uh, from a lack of iodine in the diet, and unfortunately, this is an issue in, 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 in Ghana and other surrounding regions of the world. And that issue is further exacerbated by the fact that there's a slow cyanide poisoning that happens in these regions of the world uh, because people eat cassava, which is a root, much like yams or potatoes, uh, but unfortunately, cassava uh, does have in it um, <clears throat> uh, small amounts of cyanide, which uh, exacerbates this gorgeous condition. All right, so in 1979, uh, there was a coup in Ghana, a coup d'etat, and at the time, my father was in the government, uh, in the reigning government, and so he was unfortunately one of the targets uh, of this coup and was caught in the middle of it. 
And like many of the more privileged civil servants, uh, he was targeted, he was uh, arrested from his place of work, uh, dragged uh, into an interrogation room and, uh, and levied charges of corruption and threatened ultimately with a firing squad unless he uh, confessed to these crimes. Um, ultimately and thankfully, uh, he was pardoned and uh, found innocent. Um, and I still re distinctly remember soldiers uh, bringing him back to our house, shooting rounds of ammunition in the air, and, and then leaving him in, in the house. And this scarred the whole family, uh, and my father especially. And so, as you can very well imagine, uh, our family decided to leave Ghana at uh, the first opportunity that presented itself. And so we moved to Zambia in 1984. And in Zambia, my father was a regional medical officer uh, in the town of Livingston, uh, which is on the border of uh, Zambia with uh, Zimbabwe and Botswana. And Livingston is an interesting town. It's a town uh, which is only a stone's throw away from the Victoria Falls, uh, which is, of course, one of the wonders of the world and uh, a lavish tourist destination. Um, but life was not easy for our family in Zambia. And around that time as well, uh, we had started to hear murmurings of a new disease. And I remember distinctly hearing about this disease because Daniel, who was Crystal Carrington's love interest in the show Dynasty, and I'm sort of dating myself here, and some of the older people in the audience might remember this, Daniel had died of this disease. And this, of course, was Rock Hudson, who had died of AIDS and gave a face to the name. So AIDS was starting to emerge around that time in, in, in Zambia, and especially in Botswana. And recognizing the opportunity to make a difference uh, in Botswana, uh, we moved to uh, Botswana in uh, 1986. Now, Botswana is a fascinating country. Uh, to the west of the country uh, lies the Kalahari Desert. Um, and in the Kalahari Desert uh, live uh, an indigenous tribe of people called the San people. Um, and during the time that we lived in uh, Botswana, these people were undergoing a, a turbulent time of modernization. Uh, if you're not familiar with the San, uh, perhaps one perspective that may uh, provide some insight is the movie uh, The Goss Must Be Crazy, uh, which chronicles an encounter of a San man with a Coke bottle. Now, imagine that as a plot for, for a movie. Um, so juxtaposed uh, with the San people in Botswana uh, was diamonds and diamond mining. Um, and so it turns out that Botswana has the Juanang mines, and this is uh, an incredible uh, resource for diamonds, and so the country has prospered uh, from this. However, uh, like other neighboring countries where mining uh, is, is, is quite prevalent, uh, many young people, uh, men especially, will travel along a great road that descends all the way from Central Africa. And so I show this road here in blue on the map. Um, and this road uh, descends all the way to the Kimberley mines of South Africa. But unfortunately, this is a road that has also led to a radial spread of HIV AIDS uh, in, in, in Botswana and other countries. And so at its height, there was one in three people between the ages of 15 and 49 in Botswana was HIV positive. To me, that's just an astounding number. Um, and uh, boy, you know, that's a number that really uh, resonated with me. And so <clears throat> my travels and experiences uh, made me painfully aware in Africa, especially of, uh, of parasitic diseases, um, which unlike viral diseases like AIDS and Ebola, are less of a global threat, right? Um, and yet, many still die from these parasitic afflictions. And so I've had relatives um, that have contracted uh, many of these parasitic diseases. Um, and I myself have contracted some of these diseases. And so words like malaria, uh, bilhazia, or elephantiasis were household names to me uh, as, a, as a child. It's incredible. <clears throat> but one particular disease that really resonated with me is called uh, river blindness. And river blindness is an affliction that uh, arises from a parasite that enters a human host from an adult black fly that's infected. And once it bites its host, it deposits this parasite, which travels through the body and, and eats away at membranes in your body and ultimately ends up in the eyes and eats away the eye membranes. And people go blind from this, right? Um, and so you can see the statistics here. But it wasn't the affliction per se that really made an, an impression on me. It was actually the response to this affliction. And so um, in the early 80s, the company uh, Merck Pharmaceuticals 
actually gave away uh, uh, ivermectin, uh, which is uh, a structure of which I show here um, on the slide. They gave it away for free um, to, to combat uh, river blindness. And, and what really uh, made an impression on me was that ivermectin was initially developed to treat heartworms uh, and other worms in animals. And so this was actually a veterinary drug which was so effective at, at actually curing human disease as well. And that made a huge impression on me. It really got me interested in chemistry, which is what I do, um, and, and I was hooked at that stage. And furthermore, as an eight-year-old, I remember distinctly uh, pouring through uh, this volume here called the Merck Index, as well as a physician's desk reference, which is a Bible for my, for my father, and uh, really finding out about all these hexagons joined with pentagons, uh, which were these organic molecules which could cure all this disease. Uh, you know, my parents thought I would become a medical doctor, but uh, there's no turning back for me. I, I really had to be a chemist, okay? So let's just fast forward uh, to the present, and I have to say that there are many mentors and, and many supporters that have made it possible for me to be here. Uh, we've heard stories today about, about what life is like in sub-Saharan Africa, and I have lived it, and yet there are many that do not look like me that have supported me to where I currently am. Um, and so my research group at Berkeley uh, works on structures uh, similar to ivermectin, uh, such as the ones shown here. And these are examples of compounds called natural products. And so there are scientists in the world that actually scour the earth uh, looking in the Earth's oceans and on and exotic plants for compounds that can actually cure disease. And guess what? We've had a lot of success doing this over the ages. And even to this day, about 50% of the drugs that you and I take, medicines rather, <laughs> that you and I take, uh, <laughs> uh, these, these medicines have their basis in these natural products. It's pretty amazing. Um, um, but in addition to that, what I really love about what we do in my, in my laboratory is that we do something called organic synthesis, where we actually prepare compounds from scratch, and we prepare these compounds from readily available commodity chemicals that are the byproducts of the petroleum and agricultural industry. And so these make it possible for us to prepare things that are not even known in nature. All right, so for example, this compact praziquantel on the bottom left, this was prepared de novo, and this is a, a, a treatment uh, that is used for bilhazia. Um, and our laboratory has been really interested in this exercise of organic synthesis. We are uh, pursuing the synthesis of compounds like Durquantel, uh, which is actually used to rid, to rid sheep of worms in New Zealand. And we believe that it has parasitic properties uh, that will make it possible uh, to address disease in Africa. I wanted to finish up today with the story of Martha. And so I show a picture of Martha here. Uh, Martha is a research and development uh, project manager at GlaxoSmithKline Pharmaceuticals in Philadelphia. And she chose to work for GlaxoSmithKline Pharmaceuticals out of a range of other companies uh, because of this compound, albendazole, uh, which it turns out was a veterinary drug that has been repurposed by the company uh, to uh, address diseases like elephantiasis in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, Martha, very much like me, was influenced by um, all the happenings in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa with regard to uh, parasitic diseases and chose to work uh, at GSK for that reason. And I know this because Martha, in fact, is my sister. Okay. <laughs> all right. But I wanted to finish up today uh, with this slide, which is that when you now think about the face of disease in, in Africa, and especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, it is my hope that you will now see another side uh, to that coin, uh, which is that there are many Africans who are resolved to do something about it. Okay? Uh, it's not a helpless population, um, and, and I think that I represent just one modest example of this. Uh, Ebola, as we all know, has uh, been uh, a terrible uh, aff uh, affliction in, in West Africa, and uh, I tell you that it's a dark cloud, but I cannot wait uh, for the silver lining of the new generation of Africans that I am convinced it will inspire to cure diseases in far-off places like sub-Saharan Africa, um, but it will also lead to cures for diseases like cancer and Alzheimer's disease that perhaps hit closer to home. And I can't wait for that day, and I'm convinced that we all can't wait for that day. Thank you very much.